All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we are going to talk about the laws of planetary motion. So now, when it comes down to these three laws, we only need to know two of them for Earth science regions. Okay, I'm not making you do any math, so don't get any scared or some crazy ideas when you see math show up. Okay, if you were in honors, then yes, you would have to do math. And if you plan on going to physics, you will have to know how to do the math for this. But for this class, you will not. All right, so first of all, there are the laws of planetary motion. They're called actually Kep uh, Kepler's laws, right? So this is uh, Johannes Kepler. Basically what he had said is that number one, the planets move in elliptical orbits. What that means is that they are not perfect circles. Okay, we already know this. We already know this. I pointed this out to you guys a bunch of times. The orbits that the planets go in are not elliptical. Comets do not move in elliptical, or they only move in elliptical orbits as well. Okay, they are not, not, not perfect circles. All right. Now, inside of the orbit, there are going to be two points called foci. F O C I. Okay, foci is just the uh, plural of focus. Okay, so if it's one point, it's a focus. If it's two points, it's foci. All right, for the planets, for every single elliptical orbit for the planets, the sun is at one of those two points. Make sure you know that. Okay, no matter what, the sun will be at one of those two points for a planet. Okay. Um, the other point is a star whose name is not important for regions or science, so you do not need to know it. You just need to know that the sun will be at one of the two points. If they don't tell you in a question that um, which one is the sun, you get to pick, okay? And then other things form around that, okay? The second thing is, and this sounds a little confusing, but I'm going to explain it to you, okay? It says the line that joins the sun and a planet sweeps equal areas in equal intervals of time. Okay, so basically there is an imaginary line that connects the earth to the sun, right? That imaginary line is called gravity, right? That mutual gravitational pull between the earth and the sun and the sun and the earth, right? That keeps the planet in the orbit, right? There are some times where we are closer to the sun in our orbit, and there are some times when we are further away from the sun in our orbit, okay? When we are closer to the sun, we are going to move faster in our orbit, and when we are further away, we are going to move slower, and I will explain that using a picture in a little while. Okay, the third law, this is the one that you just need to write down in your notes, you are not going to be required to do math for this, okay? So don't get scared that it says t squared and r cubed, okay? But basically, the third law of planetary motion is the square of the time of revolution is proportional to the planet's mean distance from the sun. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to write that down. You guys good or you need me to wait? I'm good. I'm good. Anybody need me to wait? Okay. So draw this picture in your notes, please. Okay. You need this picture in your notes. And if you're using your iPad, there's an ellipse function. Instead of drawing a perfect circle, you draw something that looks like this, and you can pull it out, right? Okay. These two dots, those are the foci. Okay. Where one of them will always be what?
What will one of those two foci always be for a planet, guys? Yes. That wasn't an answer. What will one of the two points always be for a planet? I'm oh, sorry. Not the moon. We just went over this. I was like, should be the question I was writing on the picture. Sure. Okay, so these are the two foci, right? The two points inside of the Earth's ellipse. Let's just say it's the Earth, right? That's its orbit, okay? What will one of these two foci always be for a planet? Out of focus? No. Okay. The distance between? No. Those two points. For a planet, one will always be what? I just went over this. The sun. There we go. Okay. Well, one will always be the sun. Okay. You guys have to know that. That is very important. Okay. Because you can answer about 10 questions once you know that one point. Okay. So one of these two points are always going to be the sun. All right. If it's not given to you, like if it's not labeled, or if it's not said to you in like a little blurb at the top, you get to pick which one, all right? For this case, we're gonna say this purple one is the sun, okay? So as we're moving in the orbit, we're moving, all of a sudden, notice that we're getting closer to the sun, right? What happens to your gravitational pull when you are closer to the other object? It decreases? No, it's actually the opposite, right? Think of two magnets. The further the two magnets are apart, the less likely one's going to be pulled to the other. The more you clo you inch them closer and closer together, there, be there becomes this pull, and all of a sudden one of them will go whoom, to the other, okay? It's the same thing that happens with the planets, okay? The closer they are to the sun, the faster they're going to move. So in the orbit, when we're closest to the sun here, we're going to be moving fastest around it. Also, guys, if we're closer to the sun, what season are we in? Winter. Absolutely. And a follow-up question. If we're winter, which way are we tilted? Um... We're tilted away from the sun? Exactly. Good job. So during winter, we're tilted away from the sun because the tilt of the axis is the only thing that changes the seasons, right? It doesn't matter how close we are to the sun or how far away we are to the sun. The tilt of the axis will actually uh, change what season we're in. Okay. So let's go back to the orbit a little bit, right? So the flatness is called eccentricity. So if we're completely a straight line, then you would be have a high eccentricity. If you are closer to a perfect circle, your eccentricity will be low. So there's two places that you're gonna look. If you look at page one of the Earth Science Reference Table, okay, page one of the Earth Science Reference Table, there is a formula there for you, right? It's the last one of the four in the same place where the density, the rate of change, the gradient formula all are, okay? It's called an eccentricity formula, right? And it talks about the length of the major axis and the distance between the foci, okay? So here we have our foci, right? In order to do this, you need a ruler, okay? So for tomorrow, 
you are going to need to bring a ruler, whether you're in class or at home. If you have to, remember how we use the one for gradient? Some of you guys downloaded pictures of a ruler. That's fine as well. Okay, so that's the, you would measure the distance between the focal points or the foci. And then you'd have to also do the length of the major axis. The major axis is the longest point from one side of the orbit to the other that goes through these focal points. Okay, um, if you wanted to, some other of my students have actually drawn a perpendicular line here and a perpendicular line here and then connected it and that's how they got the length of the major axis. Whatever is easier for you, that's fine. Um, my suggestion, because I just find it easier, but if you find something else, it's totally fine. My suggestion is start on one side of the orbit, make sure you go through both of the focal points to the other side. Um, but again, if you find something else, that is fine. Okay. There's our sun, right? Because the sun is always one of the focal points. All right, so, right? In, a, in an elliptical orbit, okay, if you had a perfect circle, it means that you only have one focus point. Okay, that's the only way to get a perfect circle is if you had one complete, uh, what you call it? If you had a one focus point, then you would have a perfect circle because it's only what you do is you put your pen there and then you draw a circle around it. Very simple, very easy. But that's not what happens here. Now, guys, this is also one of those skills that you need to know for the regents. Um, the regents has two parts for earth science. I know you guys didn't take a regents last year, but. Um, if you are looking at it, you have a written portion, which you sit down, you write, you answer like a regular test, and then you have a hands-on lab portion, okay? This is one of the things that you have to do on the, uh, the what's called the Earth Science Lab practical, okay? We're going to have to work on this. So the, when I come back, I have to figure out a way <laughs> to have you guys do this, even if you're home. And that's where we're kind of at right now is trying to figure out how to do this. So just letting you guys know this is something that you are going to have to do specifically on the regents as well. It's not, and it's a little bit more important than most of the other stuff. Okay. Um, so a perfect circle has one focus. An ellipse has two foci. Okay. Those are those two points. Okay, Keith. Okay, so this is a picture of an ellipse. Notice a couple of things about it, right? First of all, it's showing the distance from the sun. Also has a couple of vocab words in here, perihelion and aphelion, okay? When something is at perihelion, it means that it is closer to us, so therefore it appears larger. So during the winter, right, the sun appears to be larger than during the summer. So perihelion, the sun is going to look larger, and they're up here, guys. There's perihelion is right here in the top right-hand corner of this picture, right? And aphelion is in the bottom left-hand corner of this picture. Okay. Another thing it's showing is the times of the year. How do we know? Because it's based on the tilt of the axis, right? In winter, we're tilted away from the sun, and during the summer, we're tilted towards the sun. If you can identify one of those two things, then you can identify all four of them, okay? Because you know that the earth revolves in a counterclockwise fashion. So if I say to myself, oh, this way, the northern hemisphere is up here, 
I'm tilted away from the sun, this must be winter. That means the one on the opposite side must be summer. And since we're going in a counterclockwise fashion, the uh, season that is in between winter and summer is spring. And the season that is in between summer to winter is fall. So you can identify all of that just by looking at the tilt of the axis. Okay? All right, so, right, if you're following along in your review book, we're on page 49, okay? So I've mentioned this word eccentricity, okay? So eccentricity is just how far off the ellipse is from a perfect circle. That's what a true circle means, right? A perfect circle. Okay, you are not going to necessarily be asked specifically to calculate the eccentricity of a specific planet. Because why? Why would you not be asked to specifically look up the eccentricity or calculate the eccentricity of a planet? Why, guys? Because you won't be able to see it. No. It's not that you won't be able to see it. But why wouldn't I ask you to calculate it? Besides, some of you guys hate math. Can you not do it with your naked eye? You can't necessarily do it with your naked eye, but what do I always say? If I didn't ask you to memorize it, where is it? Earth science Earth reference science table. table. Right, Earth science reference table. And specifically, since we're talking about astronomy, what page are we on? Fifteen. Absolutely, Anna. Good job. Okay, so we're on page 15 at the bottom, right? Page 15 has all of those different things, including a uh, column that says eccentricity, okay? Eccentricity is how far off you are from a perfect circle. Well, you need to understand that the smaller the number, the closer the orbit is to a perfect circle. So none of the numbers for uh, eccentricity are going to be greater than 1 or less than 0. All right? The closer you are to 0, the more likely you're a perfect circle. So if the orbit has only one focus, then its eccentricity is going to be 0. Okay? That's really important. That's why it's in red. So if you're looking at the reference table, you'll notice that some of the orbits get very close to zero. They're not zero, but they get very, very, very close to zero, which means that their orbits are very close to being a perfect circle. However, they're not a perfect circle. Okay, now this is the formula that is on your reference table, table, okay? It's the distance between the foci over the length of the major axis, okay? When you are actually figuring out the distance between the foci, what I say to do is measure from the center of one foci to the center of the other foci. Because otherwise, if you go from the end to the end or the middle to the, or the side to the side, you can get a different number, which can make your eccentricity differently. So you want to make sure when you're using this, number one, if you're doing this on your iPad, you should be using the guided access where, you know, you circle it and you make sure that it doesn't move. So it makes your life easier and that you put your uh, you put your ruler in the middle of one foci and you do it to the middle of the other which when you guys were looking at the picture, right, the distance between the foci was smaller than the length of the major axis. So you would assume that your eccentricity should be less than one because the length of your major axis should be greater than the distance between the two foci. That's why for a perfect circle, 
the distance between the foci is zero, it's non-existent, which you end up getting zero divided by any number is zero. Right? Yes? You guys remember? All right. So let's look. All right? There's the length of the major axis. There's the distance between the foci. All right? I want you to practice and try. Take a picture of this really quick. And I want you to practice while I pull up a video. Okay? I want you to practice trying to use a ruler as best you can. For those of you who are in school and don't physically have a ruler, if you Google image a ruler, okay, and it should be in millimeters, I believe it is, um, okay, you need a, that kind of a ruler or centimeters, centimeters, okay? I want you to try and do that. Well, I pull up the video. Okay. Okay, so let's watch this video together. Hi everyone, welcome to the Earth Science Regents Review podcast series, created by Hamix Middle School Earth Science Department. Today we're going to focus our attention on ellipses in Kepler's three laws. We ask ourselves the question, what is an ellipse? It's a rounded geometric shape that can vary from the perfect circle all the way through a straight line. Now this is important to earth science because every object that makes a trip around the sun that's part of our solar system has some sort of an elliptical orbit. It's never gonna be a perfect circle. It's gonna be somewhat of a flattened oval as, it's make it, as it makes its way around the sun. So how do we measure this? We measure it through a process called eccentricity. That's a measure of how round or how flat an orbit is. And we basically tend to say that objects are either going to be highly elliptical or non-elliptical. Your non-elliptical are going to be round. Your highly elliptical are going to be very flattened. So we care about this because this refers to Kepler's first law, which states that all planets move around the sun, they revolve around the sun, which is one of the focal points along an elliptical path called an orbit. And you can see as the Earth is making its way around the Sun, it's not a perfect circle, it's somewhat flattened. So eccentricity, again, is a measure of how round or oval an ellipse is going to be. Now your eccentricity is always going to fall in between 0 and 1. If you get an eccentricity greater than 1, you did something incorrect. And there's no units. Your numerator and denominator, the units cancel out. So a perfect circle is going to have an eccentricity of zero. A completely stretched out orbit, a perfect straight line, has an eccentricity of one. So that's kind of your benchmark in terms of how to determine the shape of an orbit. So we calculate it by measuring the distance between your focal points divided by the length of your major axis. Now this is a formula you don't, you never have to memorize because it's in your reference table. It's going to be the first formula or first equations can be listed there. So distance between your foci divided by the length of your major axis. So let's get into a quick example here. So you have an orbit, say, of our Earth moving around the sun. What you're going to do is you're going to make a line, AB, straight through the center of the ellipse, basically through the fattened part of your ellipse. Your focal points are going to be the two dots somewhat in the middle of the ellipse. So those are your foci. Your major axis is going to be line A and B. So that's going to be your major axis in that case. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure the distance between your two focal points. You're going to divide that by the length of your major axis. Just a quick note regarding our sun. Our sun is always going to be one of the focal points within an ellipse. You don't have to worry about the second focal point. That's just going to be an arbitrary spot in the, in the orbit. Just always know that the sun is always one of the focal points within an ellipse. 
distance. So let's just put some numbers to it. Your x, y, your focal distance is going to be 2 million miles. The length of your major axis is 10 million miles. You put 2 in the numerator, you put 10 in the denominator, and your eccentricity is going to turn out to be 0 0.200. You always go to three decimal places after the decimal point. Always go to the thousandth place with eccentricity. So that's a relatively low eccentricity. We would say that's somewhat non-elliptical. It's very circular in nature. So the closer you get to one, the more elongated your orbit is going to be. Now, eccentricity can be found in your solar system data chart, page 15. You'll see all these numbers here. You'll notice that the biggest value given to you there is going to be Mercury. It has the flattest orbit when you compare them to the other planets at 0 0.206. You take a look at Venus, that's going to be the roundest orbit because it's closest to zero. So it's very important to have an idea in terms of what to interpret with these numbers. The most elliptical orbit you're going to find in the solar system are comets. Comets have the most flattened, the most highly elliptical, the highest eccentricity in terms of any orbit within the solar system. So just have an idea that comets have the most eccentric orbit. According to Kepler's second law now, all planets revolve around the sun and travel equal area over equal amounts of time. That just basically means that because we have elliptical orbits, you're not going to travel around the sun at exactly the same speed. So if you look at the left-hand side, you see that that shape that's shaded in covers one month of time. Well, if we we're able to determine the area of that shaded region on the left, it would equal the area of the shaded region on the right here. Even though you notice that the one month distance is different because the sun's not the center of every orbit, it's skewed to one side. You tend to travel faster when you're closer to the sun. When you travel faster, you're gonna travel a farther distance. When you're a little bit farther away, you're gonna travel a little bit slower speed and you're gonna travel a little bit shorter distance. But if you were able to cover the same amount of area, believe it or not, those two areas that are shaded in, are going to have equal areas because it's equal amount of time, one month of time. According to Kepler's third law, the closer a planet is to the sun, the faster it moves because the pull of gravity is the strongest. So you'll notice that the position of Earth in this picture, Earth is going to be traveling a little bit slower because it's a little bit farther away. If the Earth was all the way to the right-hand side of this picture, it would actually be traveling a little bit faster because it was a little bit closer. So you have the weakest gravity and the slowest velocity. You have the strongest gravity with the highest velocity. Make sure you guys understand that because that is a very important point, okay? When you are furthest away from the sun, okay, you are going to have the least amount of gravitational pull, all right? When you have the least amount of gravitational pull, it means you're going to move slower. All right, when we are closest to the sun, you have the strongest gravitational pull, which means you're going to have the highest velocity or the highest uh, how fast you move in your orbit. Okay, if we were to look back at the picture that he was showing you here, right here, we are closer to the sun, which means that we are going to move a further distance over the same time period versus over here, where we are further away from the sun, where we're moving slower, okay? Because gravity and the slowest velocity, and you have the strongest gravity with the highest velocity. This also holds true as you travel out through the solar system. Planets that are physically closer have to travel a, a smaller amount of distance. So Earth, in this case, travels around the sun in a much quicker time than, say, Mars, because Mars is farther away. It's got to travel a farther distance. And you can even compare that with every single planet in the solar system. If you take a look at Mercury, it travels around the sun in a much faster amount of time than, say, Neptune, because Neptune is just further away. So that's it for now. Thanks so much for joining me on Ellipses and Kepler's Laws, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, so um, before I actually go back to what we're doing, uh, this particular guy, Hammocks, Earth Science Department, they have 
uh, videos on almost every topic. If you're looking for something to explain to you a little bit better, look up Homics Earth Science Department um, and put in the topic. If not, they have them all listed there for you as well. Okay, I did post this video for you guys right here on Google Classroom along with your homework, which is what you were going to start now. Okay, you're going to work on review book problems, uh, pages 51 and 52 in topic three of your review book. It says you're going to do 40 to 50, but you're really skipping 30 to 39. So you're really only doing 11 questions. All right, so that's what you guys are doing right now. And I'm going to end the recording.